none of the energy values are degenerate. That is correct. Again, one of our you know properties of bound states. Degeneracy again is non-degenerate. Okay, so none of the energy values are degenerate. So all of the energy values are non-degenerate. So that tells us that one energy value corresponds to one solution, one wave function. One corresponds to one. One corresponds to one. We don't have the case of one energy value corresponds to two. Is that the case over here? Yes, because quantum number n equals to one. We will get a certain energy value. Yes. That energy value corresponds to one solution, which is psi 1. So one e, E1 corresponds to psi 1, E2 corresponds to psi 2. No degeneracy. Now, I just want to mention that wave functions are orthogonal because if you want to proceed further in quantum mechanics, this is somewhat important okay, for our study of quantum mechanics. Now, the, when we say that two wave functions are orthogonal, what we say is that we will integrate from the region where the wave function is valued. So in this case, the, region is the, the wave function is defined from 0 to A. So we integrate from 0 to A. I will take the conjugate of one of the wave functions. So sine star m is just one of the wave functions. Multiply that by psi, sine n, another wave function. So these are the two functions that I'm dealing with. And if I were to integrate that with respect to x, I will get the Kronecker delta m n. <laughs> Kronecker delta, wow, what is it? It's actually very simple. What it's telling me is that if these two integers m and n are equal, the Kronecker delta is equal to 1. Now, I have this, I'm able to get this equation from basically taking any of the wave functions. They are actually linking the conjugate with the wave function and it's, we do that by really taking the sine function. So as you can somewhat suspect, if that I'm integrating two sine functions, right? And if the argument of the sine functions are the same, I would get one. That is what the Kronecker delta is telling us. If I take psi one multiplied by the conjugate of psi one, I will get one because of the, the property of integrating sine functions. And because of that, these wave functions are orthogonal and now I can use these wave functions as a basis for the general solutions to the problem. Okay, but that is obviously very advanced. But what you need to know is that as long as these wave functions are orthogonal, some linear algebra or orthogonality means that really the two wave functions are perpendicular. I know you can't see that here, but we also can use the same concept when we're, when we're dealing with functions, which is what we are. So when, we are, when they are orthogonal, can you imagine like, like three wave functions, they form a three-dimensional basis. They are orthogonal forms a three-dimensional basis. So basically, any point in a three-dimensional basis can be represented by the, the three orthogonal vectors. In this case, they are orthogonal functions. But all you need to know is that they are orthogonal and we can use it to form a basis. So lastly, our final part is talking about the probability density. Psi n x, take the magnitude squared, the probability density. Now, uh, with my trusted TI-89, which is you can see over here, TI-89, right? I've sketched out the probability densities on the calculator corresponding to the wave functions. Now remember, these things are wave functions. Psi 1, Psi 2, Psi 3. The wave functions of the showing the equation given by, by the solution that we have over here, solving the showing the equation. The wave functions, if I were to sketch it, but before I sketch it, I just want to tell you or ask you if, that if the wave function is equal to 0 at a certain point of x, for example, x is equal to a divided by 2, we know that Psi 2 is equal to 0, what do you think the probability density would most logically be? Probability density will most logically be equal to zero. At, okay, at nodes, at the nodes. Uh, at the nodes, sorry, at the nodes, right? Because basically if it's zero, you take the magnitude zero squared, you also get zero. So, when we look at the graph over here, and we know that at the points where the wave function is equal to zero, since the probability is equal to zero at those points, can you somewhat extrapolate that the probability densities will be broken up in certain regions for certain wave functions. Okay, that is quite, quite a thought for us to handle. Now, for psi 1, no not, so probability density, very easy, right? Very easy. Wow. Okay, a bit hard to sketch, but probability density is so easy over here. Now, what about psi 2? Psi 2, there's a node over here at a divided by 2. So, the probability density for psi 2 will be broken up into two regions. Now, I want to scale down the probability density, okay? So, we really, let's just say 1 is over here. I'm not sure what a is, but 1 is over here. So, we are sketching the probability density and scale it down here. So, for clarity, we can look at the graph, right? For psi 2, psi 2 is equal to 0. So, the probability density will vanish over here. And then, I will break it up into two separate probability graphs okay, that they correspond to the same function. So if I will take the magnitude of psi 2 for n equals to 2, I will get this graph over here by my trusted TI-89. But what I can see over here is now the probability density function is distributed into two areas. 
And that is really, you know, some of these funny things about quantum mechanics. We can find the particle, there's a higher probability of finding the particle at these two points. A divided by 4, 3 A divided by 4. But when I go to the center for psi 2, you know, it's zero. I can't find the particle there, you know. So this is something interesting, you know, for us to, to look further into. What about psi 3? Psi 3, it even gets uh, more interesting, okay. But basically, the probability density function is broken up into three regions where it's greater than zero, which is over here, over here, and over here. Because for psi 3, one of the nodes is like that. Sorry, yeah, psi 3, one of the nodes is over here, and one of the nodes is over here. So, yeah, the probability density would be over there, right? So, that is what you need to know about the probability density. Okay, finally, last but not least, I know this is a long lesson, but I, I, I think it's a productive lesson. What can I say about the potential? I can say that the potential is time independent. What do we know about time independent For potentials? We know that the solutions to the time dependent showing the equation are stationary states. Okay, I repeat. For a time independent potential, the solutions for the time dependent showing the equation are stationary states. And because of that, I can write the solutions as psi, capital psi x t is gonna be equal to one of the, the solutions. Okay, so in this case it will be psi n, psi n x. And since I know that they are stationary states, all I need to do is to multiply it by the time evolution operator, which is given s e to the minus i e t divided by h bar but now since i know that i would have an infinite sequence of discrete wave functions i will substitute the e with the e n there we go with the e n okay and then since this is the you know the most general case would be for me to write capital psi x t is gonna be a linear superposition of all the solutions for n is equal to 1 to infinity of psi n x multiplied by minus uh, e to the minus i e n t divided by h bar now i can also write e n is equals to e1 n squared okay because i know that e1 is given by this over here i substitute this inside the general equation to to get the energy value e n okay and i can substitute this inside there and you know substitute this inside here okay uh, point to take note that a linear superposition of stationary states need not give us a stationary state so this capital sign need not be a stationary state if we take the linear superposition but we call this the the most general solution for the time dependent from the equation i know it's very confusing but all you need to know is that when we talk about the time dependent from the equation we are always talking about the time factor and as you can see, the time factor is over there, um, e to the t. But since it is a time independent potential, we are, we are just at liberty to multiply by this time evolutionary operator, which is e to the minus i e n t divided by h bar. For, for all cases, for all cases where we're dealing with stationary states. Okay, so that is to it, you know, really a lot of hard physics stuff here. And I really like it, you know, we can talk about the, the physics. The mathematics, solve the potential, get the potential, get the solutions, graph the solutions, use the theorem about the nodes, you know, sketch out the probability density function, talk about the linear dependency, all this is linked up together into the wonderful world of quantum mechanics where some things are bizarre, but still the mathematics explains it for us. Thank you.